Good morning, one and all, and welcome to another broadcast on this beautiful Wednesday morning of Golden VCR. Away we go. Nine months from West Coast Deb and a well, a well-timed stand back. Thank you, everyone. Um, oh, I have a, a new tape inspector. Like, are you a good dog? She is, in fact, a good dog. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing well this morning. It's Wednesday again. It's, geez, Louise broadcast 113 of Golden VCR. Um, and I, yet again, have some stuff to work on <laughs> this morning uh, that I really want to want to focus on. So we're going substitute teacher mode again. It might be a slightly short stream, but uh, we're in here for a couple hours at least. And I got a couple tapes picked out. How would you like to remember Chicago? This tape was sent in by Trill Girl, uh, along with a few others in, a, in the same series. It's a public television documentary about the wistful past of the city that never sleeps, the city of a thousand hot dogs, the city where it stinks like cow farts and it's cold all the time. Oh, the Windy City. That's right. Uh, the Windy City. The beautiful Windy City, Chicago. Um, so let's uh, let's check that one out, huh? It's been a really long time since we've had a "Hey, old people, remember what it was like when you were young?" tape. Um, we had a what was it? Things that aren't here anymore from KCTS Seattle. Way back in. Uh, Way back in broadcast 19, uh, but let's kick it Chicago style today with remembering Chicago. We also have remembering Chicago again and remembering Chicago in World War II, if you like war or repetition. Uh, but for now, I figure we'll... Oh, that's the wrong one. I figure we'll start with the uh, original. Remembering Chicago. 60 Minutes. Produced in 1994. And a... Oh, I guess I should do an offensive voice, right? A nostalgic look at Chicago during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. A streetcar ride to the Loop was seven cents, and a box of popcorn at the Marlboro cost a nickel. The Bob's was the most ferocious roller coaster in town, and couples danced at the Aragon Ballroom to the swing of big band music. Ditka. Ditka. Remembering Chicago relives the moments of a less complicated time as Chicagoans share humorous and touching stories from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Personal snapshots and historical footage provide fascinating insights into an era that is now just a memory. Experience the daily adventures of life in those times. Recall the Rum Boogie Riverview Park, Maxwell Street, the century of progress, world's fear, and other local landmarks. Time travel to Chicago where the Cubs were always winners. Doors were left unlocked and the Iceman delivered. Come along with us and remembering Chicago. All right. Uh, apologies to those of you from Illinois. Let's uh, remember Chicago now. Remembering Chicago from WTTW Television. Activate tape. Hooray, public television. Please enjoy. I'll be hanging out here with you, but also writing code.
Listen here, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I think I know what a Chicagoan sounds like, all right? They talk that funny talk up there. When I came to Chicago in 1927, I was five years old. Our first location residence was at 37th and Cottage Grove. I was raised, uh, in fact, I was born over on Edgewater Avenue. Grace and Broadway, I lived in that neighborhood. And then I moved over to Bell Avenue, which was near uh, Lawrence and Western. I was born in St. Gabriel's Parish, graduated from St. Gabriel's in 1934. That's in Canaryville. I lived uh, on Independence Boulevard for many years. We lived at uh, 37th and Giles. Growing up, um, the neighborhoods were wonderful. We'd have block parties where my mother would bring hard boiled eggs or something. That was our picnic in the street. <laughs> in all neighborhoods, there uh, were, was a feeling of closeness, uh, a feeling of neighborliness, a feeling of, of families. We knew everybody in the whole neighborhood. and. Uh, we went to school from the time we were in grammar school up through high school with the same people. You knew the grandmother of, uh, you know, your boyfriend and, uh, or girlfriend. But at that time, everybody knew that somebody was ill, everybody was there to, to bring food in and to take care of these people. Oh, and doctors used to come to the house. In the 1920s, the people who lived in these houses walked these streets and sat on these porches were fully confident that Chicago was going to be the greatest city in the world. Chicago had a lot of vitality and Chicago had a lot of industry and Chicago had a lot of, we had the meat packing plants, we had the steel plants. It was a time of a, a great optimism, a, a sense that this was going to last forever and that uh, uh, the city was uh, going to be the greatest city in the world. Life was much slower. It was uh, uh, not so fast paced. Amusements were a lot of home things, either at your home or someone else's home. Friends would get together. Everybody associated without even calling on the phone, they used to uh, sit on the front porch. Everybody sat on porches and talked to each other, not only next door to each other, but across the street from each other. Um, porches were big things uh, back in those days. Sat on the front porch, and this lady made good pumpkin bread, and that lady made good something else. And then before long, the whole porch was full of people from the neighborhood, and everybody was friendly. You were friends almost immediately. We used to sit on a porch at night, you know, and the winds would come, uh, you know, breeze would come. Or if it was real hot in the house, we didn't have any air conditioning, we didn't have a fan. We used to sleep in the grass or in the yard. We'd put up a blanket and sleep there, you know. We, we loved it. Or we'd walk to the park and sleep, and it was safe. You could go to Dung Douglas Park, Independence, Garfield Park, and sleep in the grass. Nobody would bother you. People would take their blankets and uh, uh, whatever bedding or pillows they had and come sleep at the lake. And thought nothing so apparently of. they didn't have vagrancy laws and harsh policing. No thought or concern about security because it wasn't a problem. No feeling of, of being uh, uh, approached or, or harmed. We felt so safe. Our neighborhoods were safe. 
safe, we'd stay there all night. And that was the kind of a feeling that existed in the neighborhoods in those days. We would go and sleep on the grass. A boy, a girl, a boy, a girl. No drinking, no sex, no dope. Just nice, <laughs> cool grass. This is really, you As kids get off my lawn. We had so much freedom. You could be outdoors, anywhere, and, and uh, we play hopscotch. We used to jump rope a lot. I, I had a very happy, carefree childhood. Nowadays, you go to Chicago, it's a hellscape. All the, everybody's out there fucking and shooting up dope. <laughs> Oh, and now I think the, the best They're not even arranging themselves, boy, girl, boy, girl. We used to play that in an alley. We played house, you know. We had tea. Uh, we played completely different than the kids do today. It was not as planned. It was not as organized. The idea of calling a friend and making a date, that just wasn't done. We just automatically met someplace. Oh, we had a park. There was Washington Park. And at that time, there was a, a lagoon over there. You could rent boats for like maybe 25 cents, go out rowing on the lagoon. Yeah, when are they going to start talking about pizza? Day, uh, in the summertime, playing baseball in a vacant lot. Those were, those were pleasant days. There were not so many cars. Uh, you could play baseball on the street like I did. We used to play ball on the street. And if a car would want to go by, you'd say, wait a while, one more out. You know, we, we thought nothing of the guy would wait. There were f far fewer drivers. There weren't that many cars available. People rode streetcars, buses. Not nearly as many families had automobiles. And driver's licenses weren't required. Anybody who had a car could drive it. First driver's license I ever sent for was 50 cents. No examination, no nothing. You sent your name and address and telephone number in and you got the license and the next mail. When uh, people got a car, it was a big deal. Everybody came around to look at it, examine it. Everybody wanted to go for a ride. Everybody didn't have an automobile to go to other neighborhoods. In the 20s, shopping was different because people, they didn't travel around, and so people came to the house. The vendors used to come up and down the alley, and they used to sell fruits and vegetables. Oh, and the ice man used to come, and we used to jump on the wagon, and he used to chip the ice, and there'd be little pieces of ice, and of course, your parents would always say, don't eat it, you'll catch pneumonia, you know. <laughs> In those days, we didn't have refrigerators. You used to put a little sticker in your window that said you wanted ice to stop there. The sign was a square sign. It said 25, 50, 75, 100. So if you, wanted, if you had a big ice box, you could put a big chunk of ice, which would last about three or four days, you know. And then you had a pan underneath, and it was always somebody's job to remember to empty the pan. And if you didn't, you sometimes come home and water was all over the floor. And when it did flood the kitchen floor, we were in trouble from our parents. I remember an organ grinder used to come and go up and down the streets. And all the kids would come out and they would throw pennies in the, and the monkey would pick up pennies or whatever. And boy, that monkey was he well trained. He could get those crooked Carter has pills. The knife sharpener. He would come on a regular schedule and my mother would have the knife, knife ready and we'd get down and he'd sharpen it right out in the alley behind the house. And the milk, of course. They delivered all the milk. We would get our milk in bottles, no less, with the cream on top. They paid it at the end of the week or the end of the month. We had a number of stores nearby that we could walk to, too. We didn't necessarily have to wait for the vendors to come in. They used to have mom and pop stores everywhere. If you wanted bakery goods, you'd go to a baker. If you want meat, you'd go to a butcher's shop. The butcher stores used to stay open till 9 o'clock. Now you could get everything in one place. 
but uh, it lacks the warmth of the old days where you knew everybody and uh, they'd have your pickle ready for you. You couldn't shop once a month like now. We, like now we have a deep freeze. Yes, we went shopping practically every day. There was a little candy store in the neighborhood that I used to go to every Sunday. And you could buy these penny candies. And they made toffee in the window. Beautiful ice cream parlors. There was one in every block, and they were nice. Don't you remember the uh, place we used to always go to at uh, Crawford in uh, Irving, the Buffalo? Oh, the Buffalo was a fabulous place. My husband used to say to me every night, how about it, babe? You ready for a hot fudge Sunday? <laughs> the drug stores were usually... I'm sorry, I love that lady in her line. <laughs> My husband used to say to me every night, how about it, babe? You ready for a hot fudge Sunday? The drug stores were usually... It's so precious corner. and delivered <laughs> in every such a matter-of-fact way. Every other corner had a matter of fact drug way. store with booze, but they called it medicine. And if you had a clout, you could buy it. Uh, Chicago was a wide-open town. Uh, you had everything in Chicago. Uh, and, uh, my corner was uh, 71st and Stewart, and within a uh, radius of a few yards, not a half block or a block, there were five handbooks where you could go in. We were betting on horses when we were young kids, and we bet in the milk store. The, milk, the guy who owned the milk store, ran the milk store, was a bookmaker, and he had very little interest in selling milk. He was selling the races, and we'd chip in a dime a piece. Five guys, you put in a dime. I mean, I'm talking about people who are 13, 14 years old. You could find a bookie on every corner, and you still can. <laughs> Nobody cared. Nobody cared. It was, a, it was, I've always thought of it as an enlightened era. <laughs> In those days, everybody went to the movies. Our mom would give us a quarter. We'd go to the show, to the ice cream parlor, and have money for a White Castle. Most of the movies would uh, change pictures maybe three times a week. Uh, as a youngster, Shirley Temple was my favorite. I used to dream about her. You're not a good woman. You're crazy. You've got to be good to get stuff like this neat hard time. She was the greatest little star ever was. She was everybody's darling, everybody's darling. Shirley Temple and Rin Chin Chin, the dog. Many people went once or twice a week. It was a ritual. And they had dish night last night. You get the dishes and glasses, two cents on Tuesday nights. And of course, you'd build yourself a set of dishes. I still have some dishes. I still have some glasses. Theaters in those days are not like the theaters today. Today, they put them up with look like boxes. In the olden days, it was a work of art. All of the theaters in the 20s, you know, were very elaborately decorated on the inside. Uh, very palatial. Beautiful lobby, sometimes three or four stories high. Many of them had a grand staircase where you could go to the balconies from the lobby. Two of the great theaters in my neighborhood were the Marlboro and the Paradise. The Marlboro Theater, just west of Pulaski on Madison, and the Paradise Theater, just north of Madison on Pulaski. Now, the Marlboro was a work of architecture. It was beautiful. The outside had, like, looked like almost like a church. Paradise was my favorite for looks. It was beautiful. It's like walking into a paradise. There were statues in the lobby, uh, fountains, and the walls were marble. And you, you walk in, and the clouds are above your head with the stars. It's a different world. And you walked out of there, where was I? <laughs> you know, it was great. There were a lot of smaller theaters 
uh, that we would go to as kids on Saturday afternoon and see the cereals. And they'd, they'd break it off, you know, and you'd dying to get back to see what happened the next time. This is Shirley McMillan. I'm in the colonnade. Help me. Help. Help. And you used to go every week because you didn't, when they left you, the heroine was dangling from a, a branch over the cliff and, and he was riding on his horse and, you know, and you had to see what happens. <laughs> Public transportation was a fact of life for us when I was growing up. We thought nothing of taking a streetcar or se sometimes several. It was the biggest system in the world. At one time it had over 3,500 cars running. The streetcars had a commanding presence and uh, if you, you got in his way, you got hit. When I was driving, Ouch. I had to watch out for the streetcar and I mean watch out because they were big. That lady is my favorite, uh, I, know, I think. And it went up to seven cents. Horrors, you know. She's so, she's so spicy. She, you know she, she was going to the bookie yeah. every morning <laughs> to place her bets the on the milk the race. The cars were always either blazing hot or in 1994. Or the two. Sometimes didn't run on time. But they got there and they ran and they ran every place and they ran frequently. They were fun, really fun. In the winter they were cold and whatnot and they were rocky. They weren't that wobbly. They rode pretty good. People used to get sick on them a lot. They used to have a sandbox in the front of the streetcar. They used to have a sandbox on the front of the streetcar. And when somebody became ill, the conductor would have to go and put sand. They had a sandbox on there for little kids to play in while you were riding the trail. <laughs> you got on in the back. Was it vomit sand or play sand? sand? We'll never know. And then you got off at the front. But you could never get off at the back. Never. If you didn't have uh, uh, extra few pennies for the streetcar, the conductor waved you on and said, go ahead. The conductor would ring the bell twice to tell the motorman up front that everybody was aboard and was okay to proceed. You hear the clang and the, the rope man pulled the rope and all that. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. In those days, uh, it was nothing. All children knew how to get on a streetcar and go to another destination. You never worried about being harmed. We didn't have to be isolated in our own automobile to feel safe. We took the, the streetcar everywhere, everywhere. Navy Pier could be uh, reached by streetcar. Navy Pier was a wonderful place to go in the summertime. I used them to go to, um, to the shows. I used them to go to Riverview Park. They take you everywhere. You could go to the planetarium, the aquarium, Soldier Field, the Field Museum, and right to the door. We take the streetcar to the zoo to see the big gorilla. Uh, I forgot his name. His name was Bushman. Shy Sansy. <laughs> Looks like a Mad Max character. A 50 pound gorilla who was the idol of the of the zoo world, and people from all over the world came here to see Bushman. He was one of the biggest attractions that Chicago's ever had. When we grew up, uh, excitement was to go to the beach, the North Avenue beach, uh, for the day, and for that we had to take the uh, streetcar, so that was an all-day outing. I can remember taking streetcars to funerals out at 111th Street. They would put the, the casket on the front car of the streetcar, and we'd all go on the streetcar. Yeah, we used to take the streetcar, go all the way to the end of the line, and then go all the way back home. On the same streetcar. <laughs> that was our Sunday entertainment. Smelly, dirty, noisy, wonderful. <laughs> the Loop in Chicago was the center of attraction. Everybody would go to the Loop for work, for theaters, for restaurants, and you'd always go by public transportation. For excitement, everybody had to go downtown to see what was going on. The Loop in those days was crowded. It was busy, it was exciting, there was a bustle in the air. There were no shopping malls, and everybody went downtown to do their shopping. Well, the Loop was the center. Madison State was known as oh the Oh my God, it's Studs Terkel. Of the Boston Star on one side. Mandel Brothers Studs Terkel is, a, is an icon, a legend. A fair store. They were all big stores. Of oral history stores. in the U.S. 
In the 20s, of course, Chicago was the railroad center of the world. There were a thousand passenger trains each day that passed through Chicago. Places like Marshall Fields had enormous numbers of out-of-town uh, uh, charge accounts from people who might come from New York and the 20th Century Limited and go out of the city in the afternoon on one of the uh, California trains. And so they'd have a few hours to spend and a few dollars to spend, and uh, Chicago would be the beneficiary of it. The loop in those days used to be active both during the day and at night. We maybe had six or seven legitimate theaters. The Loop had great restaurants in those days. Henrici's was the first of the great restaurants. Well, Henrici's was a very, very fine shop, especially after the theater. Fritzl's was another restaurant we loved. 30, 40 dishes on the menu is supreme. Kranz's was across the street from Marshall Field, and they had the best ice cream you ever tasted. Oh, yes. Who could forget Kranz's? It was so beautiful with those curved glass windows in front. And they had little silver dishes filled with uh, whipped cream with little pedestals on. I still remember that so well. My brother and I would stop at Kranz's for ice cream on our way to the theater. And then we would go to the theater and see the latest movie. Yeah, we and don't. The latest, we don't talk about the uh, the Capone theater. brothers intimidating you into you go voting for Chicago a theater, particular candidate. Theater. And after the movie, they had a live stage show that might have been an hour. We don't hour talk and about the mob busting heads. Stage show, vaudeville, you know. The big names would come there and people could see them were next to nothing. You'd have a comedian, uh, could be an acrobatic act, and always a dance team. Tommy Darcy and Bob Crosby and Les Brown. In fact, with Betty Goodman on a Saturday, I, I saw three shows. It would be thrilling when you hear the theme song of Benny Goodman or Artie Shaw, and you usually get the chill running up and down your spine because the band and that blaring sound of the theme song, is, you're watching and hearing it. It's beautiful. Then the curtains would close, back to the movie, but we didn't go home. We stayed for another show <laughs> to bring a little lunch. <laughs> the highlight of the shows downtown was Paul Ash. Paul Ash, the fantastic musician with his hair like this. Don't you remember Paul Ash? Mm -hmm. He was at the Oriental for years. The Three Stooges had their rack, and I would stand on the aisle and I'd memorize their lines. Uh, they would say, Nellie bought a new dress, it was really very thin. She asked me how I liked it. I answered with a grin, wait till the sun shines, Nellie. The Loop had everything. Oh, theaters and plays and entertainment. All sorts of people, all day long, activity, even into the evening hours. It was full of people. There was no question about it at any time of day or night. I remember when I was about five years old, I think. The biggest deal to me, was my mother would take me onto the streetcar and we'd go to Maxwell Street. They had all used clothes and pots and pans and hot dogs. So, well, Maxwell Street was the mecca for getting things cheap, and you would get cheap things, <laughs> you know. During the Depression, the many uh, people, but I think everybody that I knew was going down there. The Depression was a time of great paradox. People worried about finding a work, people worried about paying the rent, people worried about where to buy food. People would come to the back door and ask for food, and my mother would always prepare something and have them sit out on the porch, And but that was common in, in all families, had people come to the door. Economically, it was a very difficult time. And uh, I know that because my husband was in the building business and there just was no building business. But at the same time, there was this feeling of wanting to escape. People needed some way to get away from the problems of the world. 
They could go to the movies for a very low price. They could go to the beach. Chicago had a great advantage over other cities. Have beach in the heart of town, along Michigan Boulevard, Outer Drive is a lake. Very few cities have that. But there was something else. There was an amusement park called River View. A bunch of us, four or five or six of us, usually go to Riverview in summer in, in, on two cent day. And you could go on any ride for two cents. Usually the ride cost five cents or maybe 10 cents if it was an expensive ride. Well, that was a big sum of money in those days. And oh, when the streetcar stopped in front of the Riverview entrance, it was just a flood of people coming out. It was just beautiful. I went to Riverview oh, oh, a thousand times. I had four sisters. And we went, the whole army of us, whole army, including one time we dragged my mother. Come on, let's go. When I was a little kid, whenever we had a birthday cake and he made a wish, my wish was, I want to go to Riverview. <laughs> Riverview at one time was called the world's largest amusement park. And it was situated in Belmont and Western Avenue. I owned the Ferris wheel at Riverview for 27 years. I like Lillian Glick a lot, too. She reminds me of Julia Child, the way she speaks. All the kids used to love it. Yes, the first thing they'd hit was the Ferris wheel, you know. You'd hear them screaming and yelling, and it was really happy. Aladdin's Castle was, of course, it was a fun house. You would go through these dark passageways and all of a sudden something would pop up at you out of nowhere or, or some great giant spider would come down off the wall you see it was meant to frighten you or some, those air drafts would, would blow, of course, the skirts of the, of the ladies, you know. That was all part of the fun of the whole thing. Remember the bug house, Molly? Yeah. Where you could go in and spend the whole day, see yourself thin and see yourself fat and short and tall. You couldn't wait to go to the next ride and one of the big things was the shoot the shoots. You were unlucky and you were in the front row, you got soaked. <laughs> you, you didn't get soaking wet, but you got a lot of spray. It was, it was exciting. I remember going on the parachute and I couldn't find anybody to go with me. And it takes you up very slowly to the top. And then it hits some kind of device up there and then this little parachute opens. And uh, you just sort of floated down. Scary, but it was fun. It was a good ride. But I wouldn't do it again. My time was spent on the, was spent on the roller coasters. I loved them. Bob's, of course, was the ferocious one. That was the steepest one. That was the fastest one. That was the one that you know, was the scariest. Everybody had to go on that. Some people wouldn't go on it. The backseat of the Bob's was always the greatest because uh, as you went over the hill, uh, it just threw you against the safety bar and it really whipped you around beautifully. I didn't like the high ride. I just couldn't stand them. They made me sick. So my job was to stand and hold the purses for the girls. That was thrilling. Riverview didn't have a ride called Tunnel of Love. It was called the Mill on the Floss. Oh, the Mill on the Floss is my favorite ride because it was nice and quiet, and although I never had a boyfriend to cozy up to. One of the differences between Riverview and maybe the old amusement parks and today's theme parks, uh, today's theme parks are antiseptic. They're so clean. The old parks smelled good. Uh, you could go to Aladdin's Castle and the place would stink most of the time. A good smell though, a nice smell. Riverview was... Sand and vomit raffish. everywhere. The word is raffish. Riverview had sideshows. The fat lady, the tattooed man. The crazy mirrors and the freak shows. And it was very, very exciting, especially in the evening when it was lit up. Especially for us kids in the 30s and 40s. Uh, that really was a fantasy land. That was magic to behold. Everybody was happy there. Yeah, that was a place I would miss. Oh, I loved Riverview. I did. And I wish it was still there.
Lane is going to Sports were big now. all during the Depression. The racetracks were filled because people had no money, so they managed to bet it on the horse. Sports was a great relief and a great way to get over your tensions. At that time, Chicago had two professional football teams. The Bears played at Wrigley Field. We also had a second professional football team, and that was the Chicago Cardinals, and they played at Comiskey Park. High school football was bigger than college football and pro football in those days. Every year, we had a gigantic game where the public league champion played the Catholic League champion, and this was held in Soldier's Field. I think it was 1939. That Austin uh, uh, Leal game was played in uh, 1937. They drew the largest crowd ever for a football game. Leo and uh, Austin drew 120,000 to that game. There were about 125,000 people. 130,000 jammed to see Bill de Corvant and Austin High School defeat Leo. I used to take my mother to Wrigley Field when she'd come up because she had never seen a big league ball game. The Cubs owned town at that time. Uh, the Sox were going nowhere. It was fun watching them because we won games. In those days, going to the bleachers is something you did. <laughs> I bet it was better back then because the Cubs didn't okay. suck. Let's go to Cubs Park. We go pay a buck and a half. Uh, the players were more fun-loving, and uh, there was more uh, rapport between the fans and players in those days. Uh, Gabby Hartnett once posed with Al Capone. This was the greatest Cub team of all time. They <laughs> we finally get an organized role. crime reference. Some acknowledgement that the city was owned by Al Capone. <laughs> Probably the biggest spectacle of all time was the heavyweight title fight. When Joe Lewis would fight, uh, the whole world would be watching. Joe Lewis came along in 1935, created a lot of excitement. Uh, mobs would stop him on the street, ask him for autograph. Uh, he was just a hero that everybody worshiped. Uh, you know, I can remember Joe Lewis after every fight, he would always say, Mama, I had another lucky night. The things I miss are, are the, the zany things, and uh, for example, uh, the best example, the six-day bicycle race. And these bicycle riders would ride around the clock. I was too young for this aspect of it, but the best time was about two o'clock in the morning. They'd be riding slowly around the track, and then some politician or some uh, gangster in the balcony would say, uh, $200 to the winner of the next sprint, and away they'd go riding like mad. And it just was so crazy. Al Capone would be there now. Now, I didn't see Al Capone. Everybody talks about a relationship with Al Capone. Unfortunately, I never met Al, although I lived about a block from where his mother lived when I was a little kid. And we used to run around the house after Boy Scout meetings, and we'd always think maybe there's a guard there and he'll come out with a gun. Yeah, the most kindly, peaceful old lady who ever lived. It's really crazy how like the of idolized really these guys were. About 1926, to uh, counter the image of Al Capone and they were, uh, in Chicago, brutal murderers. Well, Roosevelt came and opened the fair. He was president. It was a, a big, big uh, fueled event in the city. Massive political century corruption. Century Progress was the only World's Fair that ever made any money. The fair was paid for largely by private investors, uh, including uh, tens of thousands of Yeah, I mean, that's, that kind of thing is still anymore, yeah, in the playbook of very good organized investor. criminals. It started in 1933, carried over, did so well, it carried over to 1934. And it was right Makes it all the, the more important to, like, have a functioning society field. so that... <laughs> when it was time for the century of progress... Yeah. So that murderers and criminals don't step in and, like, do the job for lines. you very important to get people to and from the, the uh, exposition.
My husband built the Swift and Company building, and he worked on the uh, Sky Ride, which was very exciting and scary. The Sky Ride, which went from the uh, mainland over what's now Burnham Harbor across to the island, which is now Meg's Field. I was scared to death, but people just loved it. I was about 10 years old uh, during the century of progress, and my father had built the, uh, many of the buildings there, and I remember that we were on the top of the administration building when the Italian aviators, led by Balbo, flew in. And I can remember my father saying, they've come all the way from Italy, and we thought it was a miracle. The theme of the fair was Century of Progress, and it showed very modern buildings. They had, like the automobile, they had the autos of the future. And those were big exhibits, big, big buildings. It was an adventure. And I can remember they had uh, chairs that young men would push the chairs. And my grandmother would be pushed all over the fair. And they had big buses. They were open on the sides and they were pulled by a tractor. And you could get on and ride any place in the park. This is a picture of the, all of the people in the Bowery, which was on the midway where, where the uh, honky tonk and all of the entertainment was. My dad is right in the middle. The, the group of uh, chorus girls were in the front. The headliner, like Tina, she had nothing to do with the chorus girls, and the chorus girls had nothing to do with the showgirls, and it was a very, they used to have terrible fights. There were people from all over the world that came and visited, you know. And well, there were many people from the out, our neighboring states, like Wisconsin and Indiana. We had relatives come from as far away as New York, Schenectady, Hoboken. So many people from downstate came up with their families. Oh, there were such mobs of people that came every, every, every day. It was bringing in a lot of people from all over the world, and it also brought in a, a lot of uh, money to the hotels and the restaurants. So many people came and simply stayed in their cars, and they would uh, stay in, in tourist parks, or uh, sometimes just open fields can often sleep in their cars. And so, deep depression. And yet people came there, you know. Again, it was escape. It was something that Chicago really needed at that time. It gave, certainly gave a feeling of um, encouragement and that things would be better in the future, and they were. People very much believed that technology would lead America out of the Great Depression. I think many people went away from the fair with kind of a renewed optimism about what would happen in the country. It was a very, very great fair. There was something for everyone, no matter what your interest was, you'd find something that would be to your liking. Sally ran. Sally ran. Sally ran. Sally ran. Sally ran. Sally ran. Oh, Sally ran. Big deal. The star, of course, was Sally Rand, the oh. band dancer, who was marvelous. Sally was a highly intelligent woman, and she knew exactly what she was doing. Well, Sally Rand, in some areas, was considered naughty. Very exciting to a 15-year-old boy. She was always being arrested, and the more being arrested, the more people she drew. It was camp, you realize, she was very campy. Well, that was Sally. Someone asked me, what was your work during the 30s and 40s? I said, I was a Chicago gangster. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, in soap operas. I would threaten Ma Perkins, this good, honest, hardworking American woman at a lumber yard. I would, terrible to marry Marlon. And there's an organ that would play Claire de Lune. And the announcer would announce the troubles Mary Marlon had. She suffered more than St. Teresa ever did, Mondays through Fridays courtesy of Oxidol. 
Chicago was really the center of radio in the 1920s and the 1930s, even into the 40s a, a little bit. The biggest shows that came out of Chicago are household words today, 50, 60 years after the fact. Amos and Andy, Fibber McGee and Molly, The First Nighter, The Breakfast Club, Jack Armstrong, The All-American Boy, and uh, Ma Perkins, Oxidol's own Ma Perkins, America's Mother of the Airwaves. Three of the greatest kid shows of all time came out of yeah, Chicago Yeah, that is a radio. fantastic perm. And Little Orphan Annie, we had Captain Midnight, and Jack Armstrong, The All-American Boy. Now, Orphan Annie was number one in kids' radio in the 1930s. da 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 dum 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 It's Orphan Annie time. dum da 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 dum 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 Who do you see? It's Little Orphan Annie. Sandy, uh, the dog, was portrayed by three people. Someone barked, someone growled, and I did the whining or crying. <laughs> Try to sound like a dog. <laughs> Annie was known for her expressions, Annieisms, such as, leaping lizards, come on, we gotta go, hurry up. <laughs> we used to romp home from school, and we'd listen to every program when we'd send away for Ovaltine mugs and rings that would glow in the dark that would turn your fingers uh, green. And then every week when the program came on, they give you these magic numbers, and then you could decode on your little decoder what these numbers were, and you'd find out a clue to what was going to happen next week. Oh, man, big stuff. If I could, I'd want to bring back the period of the radio. You imagine what they looked like, and you got to know them as friends, and, and uh, they were part of your life. That was the wonderful part of radio, the ability for the child to imagine. The actors provided the, the sounds, the voices. The sound effects man gave us the sound. The musicians set the scenes, but the listener had to decorate the set and costume the actors, so we participated. The family, I remember, we used to sit around on Sunday and uh, clean out the refrigerator or icebox, and, and uh, we would sit around and listen to all the radio programs. Rochester, did you use my car last night? Well, uh... Rochester, I just found a bobby pin on the front seat. A bobby pin? Yeah. <laughs> what are you laughing at? There's only two of us here, and it ain't mine. <laughs> Jack Benny, Eddie Cantor. My God, whoever missed Eddie Cantor? Fibber McGee and Molly and uh, all these programs that were... Well, you got to know the people. They were characters you know, that you actually... Say right. became absolutely part of your family. And one man's family, you knew every one of one man's family. Mm -hmm. Paul and all of them. Captain Midnight and Terry and the Pirates and the Lone Ranger. Molly Goldberg, that was a wonderful popular program. Oh, was it Rosie, Sammy, and, and out loud the window. She'd lift the window up and call out. Trevor McGee's closet. You're sure it's in there? Positive. OK, here I go. <laughs> Got to straighten out that closet one of these days. <laughs> so to this day, many of us our age, when we have a disorganized closet, we'll say, well, my God, there's another type of gay's closet. When we wanted to watch the uh, radio programs, we would do the same thing that you do with TV today. Everybody would gather around and uh, watch the program, and there, was, there would be no interruptions. I got to the point where I hated anybody to come into my, our house to visit us because I couldn't look at the program. You'd invite people over, man, and sit down and stare at the radio. Well, of course, during the war, we would listen for news to see what was going on. I remember um, very vividly uh, hearing the speech of President Roosevelt when he uh, said we were going to have to go to war because of those things that had occurred with Japan. I remember very vividly when he got on the radio and made those announcements, yes, indeed. The radio was our, uh, our entertainment when we were home. I think the news we, and the music. Late at night, usually after 10 o'clock at night, you could tune into all kinds of different radio stations and pick up the big dance bands from downtown Chicago. You'd listen to uh, music from the Black Hawk restaurant or from the, the Congress Hotel. They had broadcasts from most of the major hotels downtown. 
Uh, certainly the, uh, the old Stevens Hotel, which later became the Conrad Hilton. The Sherman House, the College Inn of the Sherman House, or the Sherman Hotel. The Blackhawk Restaurant was one of the biggest name makers for the bands uh, in the country. That's why they used to want to come in at Union Scale at the Blackhawk, just to get the airtime. It was great fun to be in on a big band broadcast. In fact, uh, um, I remember my wife and I, she says, oh, don't push in so close, it's not nice. I said, come on, we'll be on the air. And then we'd cheer and holler and everything else, and then people would hear us. And, and, uh, and I'll tell my friends who weren't there, I said, Jeremy on the radio last night. The main clubs for broadcast in Chicago and, and, and locations were the Aragon and the Trianon. As a matter of fact, the whole country knew the Aragon and the Trianon because of the network pickups out of those ballrooms. When you think of Chicago ballroom, you think of the Aragon and the Trianon, started by the Kaisers brothers. The Trianon, for example, was built to represent the Trianon in uh, France. It was a wonderful place to go and escape. Aragon Ballroom was absolutely gorgeous, just gorgeous. Wayne King was there for a long time, and Friday night was waltz night with Wayne King. We met right here at the Aragon in the 40s, right over there. The street that would end at woman is from Lewis. Chicago. And all these dancers would come out, especially the women, with their little suitcases. They looked like bobby sockers until they made the change here in the ballroom to dance, and they were just an extreme transformation. And once you walked up the stairs and into this beautiful ballroom, it was just magic. Magic happened. The orchestra. The girls in their gowns, the fellas, the terrific dancers we had those days. That was as glamorous as anything could ever be. Well, you would meet servicemen coming there, and if there weren't enough servicemen, the girls would dance with each other. It was, uh, the servicemen were welcome wherever they were. In fact, Chicago opened their We're getting into wartime now, so it's, the, the depression is, Winding Even during down. the war, there was a constant feeling of optimism with everyone. Uh, we, we always thought positive. We never thought of any negative things that would happen. We uh, worked for a common goal. Uh, we wanted the world to be a better place to live in, and anything we could do to, to accomplish that, we tried. Some of our greatest songs were written during the war. Oh, all these sad songs, uh, like I'll be seeing you, my guys come back, and the uh, White Cliffs of Dover, all these things were very nostalgic. Part of the fun of going to the ballrooms was not only the dancing, but the intermissions. They would roll down a huge screen on the bandstand. And, and the ball would bounce on the lyrics, and so you knew when to, when to sing. It was a nice little break. Go dancing was, was the ultimate in fun. And you never went out to dinner or a high-class high place or anything that you didn't, where it wasn't dancing. If you didn't have dancing, it was just, forget it. One place that I remember dancing was the Edgewater Beach Hotel Beach Walk. The Edgewater Beach, the boardwalk, was like being in Cuba. The open air, beautiful. Uh, so you'd see the stars and the band sounded so good uh, with the band show behind them. It's, it was great, you know. The entertainment was constant around there because you had the Aragon, which was uh, open every evening. You had uh, the theaters all the time. And the Green Mill was a very lively place. It was a, a restaurant, a bar, and a place where you could go to dance and meet people. The Green Mill Gardens has been at Lawrence and Broadway since 1907. A lot of history here. I started here in 1938. Seven nights a week, from nine o'clock until 3.30 in the morning. We'd have a four-piece band or a three-piece band. Then in between, we'd have an organist or a piano player with a drummer and the, the beautiful singers. A lot of times, people would 
come uh, leave the Aragon at day 12 o'clock, the dancing's over, they don't want to go home. We stop off at the Green Mill for a drink and listen to some good jazz music. When the other places were closed up, the musicians would come over here and just let the hair down and play. Oh, it was beautiful. And the people would start clapping and uh, enjoying themselves. And uh, they just uh, marveled at the music that was played here. Just about every tavern or lounge, if you went from Irving Park up to Howard Street, the most famous places were the Green Mill, the Cairo on uh, Irving Park. The 1111 Club on Bryn Mawr. And they had one of, one of the greatest trombone men was there. I forgot his name. Oh, George Brunus? Oh, yeah, yeah. And George Brunus was a terrific trombone Dixieland player. He played at the uh, 1111 Club. And on you know, his night off, Monday or Tuesday, he'd come in here and he'd play that trombone. And he'd get so drunk, they'd take his pants down and play in his shorts. Uh, there were all kinds of bands. There were small combos. Uh, there were the nine. Every time I get drunk, I just have an irresistible urge to take my pants off and play the trombone. Because it became very fashionable to dance. Every hotel had a dance band. Every hotel. In, in some cases, in two and three different rooms of the same hotel. The bands in Chicago were the thing more than any other city in the world. It, they came up from New Orleans, and Chicago became the headquarters, even before New York. Louis Armstrong never made any money when he was playing in New Orleans. He came to Chicago and became an instant idol. People who loved to go to nightclubs in those days, they not only met their friends there, but they saw great shows and it was a way to get away out of the humdrum world and live sort of a glamorous existence for a few hours. The go. biggest one was the Chez Prix, of course. That was the creme de la creme of the nightclub era. That was a, a, a great place to go. They had a key club back there where members could go and you could meet all the stars. Jam-packed nightclub, and whenever you went, it was, it was full. It was hard to get in. And uh, there was a Latin Quarter and the Rum Boogie and oh, five or six other nightclubs, which I used to make every night. That was a different era completely. It was a more lively era because people were out on the street visiting, talking, and uh, <clears throat> enjoying nightclub shows. You had all the movie stars. John Barrymore, uh, Jim Keckney, uh, Bob Hope, you name them, and they were in these clubs. On the south side, there was a club, the Leisure, and Joe Lewis, the former heavyweight champ, had a club called Rum Boogie. They always had headliners. They would have a, <laughs> they'd have a, a shake dancer. <laughs> and uh, everybody would just wait for the shake dancer. Clubs, excitement, people, and that was a reason for this. The reason was there was no television, and if you wanted to see the stars of the period, you had to see them in nightclubs. Not that they were performing, they were also guests. Club de Lisa, most unusual club, and it, it never closed its doors. It was open 24 hours a day. What was amazing about Club de Lisa, which was, I think, at 35th and State Street, was that uh, Sunday morning, I love his embroidered Bugs Bunny they playing golf. Calling, sure. uh, and they called it the uh, Milkman Matinee. You know, about Club de Lisa, I remember this one guy, his name was Crip Herd. The guy had one leg, and he'd come out, and the band would start to play, and this guy would literally dance on this one leg. Well, you had the kind of shows at de Lisa back in the 30s and 40s that you can't even get in Las Vegas now. You had at least nine, 10, maybe 12 acts. You had uh, every kind of act that you could describe, they had it. When guests came in from out of town and you really wanted to take someone to a fantastic club to have a good time, 
we took them to Club Delisa. During those days, you'd see people out dressed to the max. I mean, the women were dressed beautifully, hair just gorgeously coiffed. You walk down 47th Street, uh, heading for the Savoy, uh, Savoy or the Regal Theater, and you saw a Easter parade. Uh, I'd go to Club Delisa, I'd go to Ram Boogie, I'd go to White's Emporium, I'd go to Three Corners, I would go to all kinds of clubs. You could go from early evening to early morning and never run out of clubs. It was an experience, a personal experience that you can't find today. In those days, I would say it was a little more glamorous and exciting. It was wonderful in those days. The, the music and the entertainers were wonderful. That was as glamorous as anything could ever be. We thought we were really into something then, you know. It was a wonderful experience. It was beautiful. I look at those days as being wonderful days. I miss the, the old time orchestras, most of all. Live music is so great, you know. That was nice, real nice. I don't think there's anything comparable to it today. It was a part of our life. It was a fun part of our life. It makes me feel like I'd like to go back and do it all over again. It was such a carefree, uh, exciting time. Absolutely fabulous, fabulous. It really was. It was gorgeous. The orchestra, the girls in their gowns, the fellas, the terrific dancers we had those days. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. The music and the dancing and the girls, wow. <laughs> I guess I miss the, the closeness that people had. I miss the friendliness. Those were the romantic days, and it was a lot of fun, you know. We still talk about it all the time. It was fun. It was great. But I realize it's all gone. But to me, for my heart, it... Those were, those were pleasant days. Aw, oh, blessed old people. How swell, how pretty, how grand We have remembered Chicago. You are Alan Shepard and you grew up during the 1920s and 30s in Chicago. How did this make you feel to revisit all of these treasured memories? We, yeah, let's see. We will surely at some point watch Remembering Chicago Again, which is the 40s and 50s. And then we also have uh, World War II. A time that was universally cheery and fun and everyone only thought about good things. Uh, Chicago. Thank you to Trill Girl for sending this tape in. I, I, I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed watching it with you. Uh, let's get, as I mentioned, this is going to be a slightly shorter stream than usual in addition to being substitute teacher mode. But um, I thought... We could watch another tape now. It could be good, it could be bad. Uh, it is Selling Skin Care from Mary Kay from 2000. It's your complete video guide to uh, being a part of this pyramid scheme. Um, selling Skin Care. There's a quote from Mary Kay Ash herself on the front of the on the front of the tape. It's so important at your skincare classes that you go to give, not to get. I promise that this will help you succeed. Strangely enough, the more you give, the more you receive. All you send into the lives of others does indeed come back into your own. The skincare class is the most successful Mary Kay sales event. The selling skincare video shows you how to conduct a skincare class. You'll also hear top independent sales directors, independent <laughs> sales directors, share their tips on how to build relationships through selling skincare, how to share a time-wise TM skincare sampler, 
in how to conduct a 15-minute selling appointment. Recommended skincare class agenda. The hostess makeover, guests arrive, opening remarks, the class, group and table close, individual consultation, and hostess wrap-up. All right, let's... Uh, this is 70 minutes, but I... I God, I'm... I'm interested in getting a getting a little bit of insight into the world of MLMs from the year 2000. So we'll see how this goes. It was unkind, but I uh, rewound it before the before the stream started. Yeah, we had an Avon lady at my my school slash church everyone just called her <laughs> everyone mostly referred to her as the Avon lady I don't remember her our name skincare customers form the base for our business they're the ones who use our products they use them consistently and they're also going to be the ones who provide you a base for your business they're going to be your reorder customers because they consistently use our products so in order to have a great business in Mary Kay you have to have skincare customers Mary Kay is a lifestyle. It's not just a get ready in the morning and then you're ready to work. It's every day. You never know who you're going to run into that you want to share with. And when you love the products, you're going to naturally want to share it. It's going to be something that comes from the heart because you want to let other people experience this as well. To get to know the people, I think in other businesses, you're seeing people come and go, but Sorry, there isn't that culty. bonding experience that making friends. So I think with my customers, that they become my friends, and I get to interact, and I get to learn so much about other people, and I enjoy that. Our goal in Mary Kay is to help our customers know how to use our products and fit the needs that they have. It's not just selling what you have on your shelf at home so I you think, get rid of product. Haley, it's I really think you and I watched sure at some point they need is what a you really good video essay about how making sure that their MLMs needs are you know, you're an important factor Crayon in the process. slash appeal to the most important factor disillusioned the great Mormon housewives. And so don't worry about it. Relax. Like how it's so Have perfectly tailored to that demographic. And you've got all the tools you need right there to be successful. Just refer to your flip chart. Just glance and I'm, down I'm, and I'm getting, what you I'm need I'm getting to hardcore <laughs> Share some facts and don't worry vibes. about it. Like it's culty, but in a greatest class or you in a feel that it is, warm, it welcoming is Mormon kind fine. of way. But you'll develop a rhythm for this business and, you know, your classes will get easier and easier and more and more fun and and you'll just start to love your classes but everything is right there that you need so just have fun make a connection with your guests the most important thing just enjoy yourself and see that they're enjoying themselves too if they do then it will go just fine the flip chart is your best friend at your skincare classes when I started my business I was scared to death and to know that the words were right there and it guided me through each step I really did a great job, and I really didn't even know what I was doing. So that flip chart is there for you. Follow the flip chart. The skincare class is one of the greatest ways to build your business. Of course, it's not the only way to build it, but it's one of the best ways because it gives you a chance to meet women, to sit down and build a relationship with them, to instruct them how to use the product. Um, the bond that you build during that time continues to make them want to purchase from you. They trust you. There's such a trust factor in teaching them how to use the product so that they'll be using it years to come. I enjoy doing skincare classes versus facials for lots of different reasons. One of the primary reasons is the interaction that the customer, they have with each other. And they have fun and girls love to shop together. And I find that they will cross sell each other and they'll upsell each other and they just have a lot more fun and they're more relaxed in that class setting and they don't feel the pressure that I'm there to sell them. And as a consultant, I don't know if they, viewpoint, I also like the fact that they probably do feel the pressure that you're there to sell to them. She'll purchase. But if I have this, five this lady is incredibly intense. Class, I increase my she has an incredibly drastic. intense so energy. Skincare classes to me are totally where it's at. I increase not only my sales odds, but my bookings definitely, and they have a lot more fun. At your first skincare classes, a consultant just needs to focus on keeping it simple. Don't try to explain everything about everything. This business is not something that you learn overnight. You're gonna learn as you go, and you draw so much experience from the opportunities when you're out there. Don't wait until you know everything. Go out there and make it happen. Learn from your experiences, and it'll work, it'll work. I wanna create a desire for those 
customers to want to be hostesses of their own. I want them to see that the hostess is having a great time, that she's getting free oh, there's the and I want to provide an environment where they the want MLM to see future classes as well. And so I'm constantly romancing the product and how great it is and what they're going to get to do at their second session when I get back with them. You're constantly projecting the future and why they want to get with you again. So you have to create that vision of what's in it for them and what's coming up in the future. So there's that anticipation and that desire to schedule a second session. When your hostess knows that yeah, she my, can earn more When my brother was in high school and he was trying to get a summer class, job, he ended up getting conned into more excited vector and marketing, Cutco Knife, to them to host his classes. job and interviews. It's her talking to her friends and motivating them and to And it's just classes. really fucking disrespectful. So I like to create a wish list. I ask her, if you could use to, anything like, in the trick people into line, coming to your what did you fall in love scam with seminar you'd like to have as your own? by lying to, to them. You earn it. And so we sit down and we cover all the things um, that she liked. And I be sure to suggest things. Be sure to say, did you like that? Would you want to use this? And your head has to be going up and down. Your eyebrows should be high in the air. You're excited. She's excited. Her list is getting You want sold. this lotion, right? And she'll have an incentive. I need you to back. want this lotion. Those products for free as a result it's of... the only thing I have left is product. selling this your lotion. Your partner's in this together. This isn't you trying to do your thing to get her hold of class. It's working together so that she's a winner and you're a winner. Well, if my hostess has not already had a facial, this is her first appointment right along with her friends, I treat her just like any you of You don't understand, girls. Barbara. My garage is filled with lotion. Skincare. My husband All is going to leave me. You need skincare. to buy this palette of lotion from me. She can have that second appointment, and she can invite some more friends over, or she can invite those same friends over. Don't worry. Over, you can make your money back by selling it class to or someone else. Class or any other type of class that she would like to have, but she gets that personal pampering session at that next appointment. Especially if I've sold her on time-wise skincare. If she's tried a sample and she likes it, I still need to sit down and match a foundation shade for her. And then we can segue from there into color, and I'll do her private makeover before her guests arrive. And then that gives you a chance with them to sell that private makeover. The four-point recruiting plan is so important to integrate into your skincare classes. It works. Oh, there's a recruiting First thing plan. First, sure to do is oh, to no. plant the seed for her to consider a Mary Kay business. So I love to say, "Have you ever thought about doing what I do?" And then say, "I'd love for you to watch me throughout the skincare class, and maybe we'll talk afterwards." Plant the seed. That way, she's thinking about it, and that seed can be growing as she sees you in action and she sees you having fun. Then you want to be sure to ask her who else is coming today that you think would be great at doing what I do. She might tip you off to somebody you wouldn't have even noticed before. I love to offer an incentive for anyone who is a talent scout for you, who refers someone who might want to begin their own business. You never know when you'll get that phone call a week or month or a year later and they say, my friend's interested or my mother is yeah. interested and refer them back to you. It helps. At the very st for the first five minutes the of this tape, I was like, amazing. maybe Mary Kay was just like, a you know, focused on this independent sales thing, and, but it wasn't actually Prior a pyramid scheme. My business with Mary Kay. No, they're getting real. So they're going hard in the paint on this uh, and have recruit show me recruiting step plan. Step so that I could then show my customers step by step. Segwaying everything into. It gave me great confidence in knowing that it was with me. Bringing your friends into the fold. Tell me, Amy, are you enjoying the TimeWise products? Well, I've only been using TimeWise for about a week, but I absolutely love how easy it is to use. And I can tell the difference in how soft my skin is. Great. Are you anxious to see how easy the colors are to use? Yes. Well, Incredibly Mary anxious. Simple mistake -proof Show system me how easy it is. Select system. And it breaks down colors into cools, neutrals, and warms. What is a cool color? Great question. Cool colors have blue undertones. Warm colors have yellow undertones. Mm, I'm really drawn to the warm colors. They look great on you, and today we selected a look that goes with those warm colors. It's called Downtown Brown. And with these colors, they're going to look fabulous with what you're wearing. Downtown you think brown. Of these colors as a facial wardrobe that you coordinate, the perfect um, everything color will for be you. harmonized. Well, what if I'm still not sure for about no what color to reason. wear with my outfit? Well, that's a good question. If your outfit does have cool colors, go with the cool colors. If it has warm in it, wear the warm colors. And with neutrals, they're simple. You can use them either way. That makes sense. The fun part about color is there's so many ways to use it. Oh, to okay, me, that's I'm going to go off camera part. and write some oh, more sequel queries. With Mary queries. Kay's color select system, they take all the guesswork out of but it. But I'm still Let's get started. soaking this in. Well, it all starts with the right foundation. You want a color that suits your skin type and matches your skin tone. Have you been happy with the color you're using? I really love it because it looks so natural. It does. 
Now the next secret for getting that flawless it's looking a skin real is natural to use a human touch conversations. Of our full coverage correcting concealer. Hmm, what does that do? For any visible blemishes or imperfections, your concealer helps to hide those, like those under eye circles that you might get sometimes. Oh yes, I need that. Take your fourth finger, your ring finger, and oh, dab yes, a little I'm bit on them lightly, and just pat it underneath and blend it in so it hardly looks noticeable. That looks great. You're doing a great job. So this is part one, the Next, hostess makeover. Dust your face with a powder perfect loose She's showing powder. us how to conduct Using the private makeover ball. session yes. with your hostess At home, before the guests you would use arrive. a brush. We have a retractable loose powder brush, and it's great because you apply the powder, you roll it up, and then you have an application for later on. But today, use your cotton ball and make light downward strokes. This helps to set your foundation, reduce the shine, and gives your skin a naturally beautiful look. Am I doing it right? Yes. Just go ahead and apply the powder all over. That'll help to reduce the shine and give a natural look to your complexion. We also have Powder Perfect Pressed Powder as an option. Since it fits in our handy compacts, you can take it with you and have it for handy touch-ups. Okay, so what's next? The eyes. Great, I could really use some help there. Sometimes eye makeup seems like the most challenging part, but with a little bit of know-how and the right products, it can be a breeze. Let me show you how. I'm all yours. The first step is to apply the Powder Perfect Eye Color. Taking your sponge tip applicator, you want to apply it in the lightest shade, which is your base shade. That's your base color that goes from your lash line all the way up to your brow. Go ahead and don't be afraid to put it on. This is gonna create just a base color on your eyes. Does it feel silky? Yes. It feels like there's cream in there. The second shade is your contour shade, your darker shade. You're gonna take that along your upper lash line, out along to the outer. Sorry, you never know when you need a weird line. Feel silky? Yes. It feels like there's cream in there. The second shade is your contour shade, your darker shade. You're going to take that along your upper Be lash ordering line, a cappuccino. out along to the outer edge of your eye, then back up in along the crease. Good. And you're going to blend that. And on the back side of your card, it actually shows what we just did, so you have a reminder and know where to place it. Did I blend it okay? No, you're doing great. It feels so smooth and silky. Our next step is our Luxury Liner Eye Pencil, which is a mechanical pencil. You want to take your pencil and from the inner corner of your upper lash line, make a light little feather-like strokes toward the outer corner of your eye. It glides on easily, doesn't it? It really does. Next, you're on the lower lashes. You're going to go from the outer corner of the eye to the inner corner of your eye. Really? I always put it inside. The outside really opens up the eye more and is more hygienic. This is easier than the pencil I use. And I never have to sharpen it? No, the creamy formula makes it easy to line your eyes. And it's waterproof and smudge resistant for extra long wear. I like this color. What is it? Charcoal. Did it open up my eyes? It really did. Next, the lip finishing touch is the mascara. Today we're going to use the Endless Performance Black Mascara. I have really sensitive eyes. All Mary Kay's mascaras are ophthalmologist and dermatologist tested. When you apply the wand into your mascara, you want to put in and never pump your wand, you want to put it in and turn. If your friend if says, I'm not comfortable putting this on my face, tell them, no, Take you will. And hold it vertically and lay it along the lower lashes, putting color on them first. Then you're going to lay the curved brush along your upper lash line and lift and curl as it surrounds the lashes with rich color. Also, this does and not seem like a makeover. Clock. It seems like I hate when mascara does that. here's all this shit I'm going to make you buy. Mascaras you can try. This is great. Now take a look at your beautiful made-up look. Doesn't it look great? I can't believe I did this. Next, on the cheeks. When your cheek color is expertly applied, you shouldn't even know it's there. It'll just give a beautiful glow to your complexion. Using your cotton ball, you want to place that in your color, and you're going to start at the apple of your cheek and blend upward, stopping just below the This is just so con like so contrived. You There's want to blend so much shit so you have to do. It hardly even looks like it's there. And if you'll notice in the picture, it shows you where Don't to place. Don't you feel like your color body is, is hideous? Maple walnut. Hmm. There's I'm something really wrong with every it's part of your face. The rest of your look using that color select system makes it easy, doesn't it? You're going to have to pay and hundreds of dollars to me every month for Mary Kay products and spend hours and hours every morning. Great job. 
I like it. It's so natural. Next, we're on to everyone's It's favorite. just giving me lip real color. women sort My yourselves favorite. out vibes. Makeup just isn't complete without lip color. You want to take, first of all, a lip liner pencil. You have your little pencil there? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you want to make, first of all, you're going to define the V on the upper lip. This is going to help define where your lip is and help your lip color to resist feathering. Like this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next, you're going to take your color to the outer edge of your lip, along that line. Excellent. Then you're going to come along your lower lip and define in the middle. First of all, start in the middle. And then you're going to come from, out, from the outward to the inward to connect those lines. Wow, this glides right on. Next, we're going to use our lipstick. You're going to take that downtown brown with your sponge tip applicator and working from the center of your lip to the outer edge of your lip, apply the lip color. I just can't get over lip, downtown corner brown. To corner, filling in and blending with your lip liner. That looks fabulous on you. It's pretty. It has a natural gloss to it. I've got a lot of great lipstick shades to choose from and some other nail colors that coordinate as well. I'll show them to you after the class. Take a look at your gorgeous finished look. Don't you just feel beautiful? What did you like best about your makeover? Well, first, it was so easy because it was all coordinated for me. And second, it feels so natural. I can't wait to show you the custom compact I put together for you with your colors. It features your cheek color, your three eyes, your lip, and your brushes all in one. And it's very economical because it's refillable. When you're done with a color, you just replace it when you need one. That is so pretty. In fact, that's not all. I brought together a set for you with all the products we use today for you. It has your powder, your lip liners, your eyeliners, everything that you use today to look fabulous. Oh, boy, I'd like to have this. How much is it? It comes for only $95.50. Oh, it's customized for you. She has to pay you $95? She's already letting you use her fucking house for your sales meeting. Class in which I'm going to be trying to help you earn as much free product as you can, but I want to have a wish list that shows what you'd love to have. And so, if money were no object, tell me everything you'd like to treat yourself to, okay? First of all, you liked that customized set, didn't you? Yes. And how about that day and night solution? Mm, I'll think about that. Okay. How about the oil-free eye makeup remover? Yes. I'm glad you mentioned it. I do need that. The eyebrow pencil? Yes. Okay. You need all of these well, things. Well, you know, I can't wait for your how friends you to see you. How you live without them? Me too. Let's go over some things that I think will help your class run more smoothly. When your guests arrive, I'd love for you to introduce them to me so I can help select a foundation shade for them. Then I'd like for you to go treat them to a satin hands experience, and then they can come back and fill out their customer profile, okay? Sounds simple enough. Okay. Amy, have you ever thought about doing what I do? Where would I find the time? They always say the busy people get things done, so a little bit of time can go a long way in Mary Kay. So watch what I do today, and if it appeals to you, we'll talk afterwards. Okay. And does anybody else who's coming today seem like they'd be great at this? Well, Vanessa and Sharon would both be really great go-getters. Fantastic. Let's review a few things about satin hands. Which of your friends can I prey upon? Pre-profiling is so important because it helps you establish a connection with your customers, even before you see them. And when I call somebody, I like to say, Mary, this is Dawn. I'm going to be your consultant on Thursday evening. Could I ask you a few questions about your skin and your needs? Most of the time, they'll say yes. And then An after inflation calculator chat like command say, sounds, uh, Mary, that's a great idea. Tell me about what you currently use on your skin. Find out where she's coming from, what she wants. And then I like to ask her, what's your skin type? That allows me to talk a little bit more about the fact that we have products designed for that skin type and it allows me to prepare and bring products that are designed for her so that I can prepare adequately. And I also like to ask, if you could change one thing about your skin, what would it be? And whatever she says, I say, oh, that's great because I have products designed just for that that will help you out. So she is more excited about coming, she's more in tune with coming, and when there's something else that's tempting to take her away, she's going to say, no, I have to go because I know I was going to get that neat answer. Because quite frankly, I believe that 
A lot of times a person doesn't attend a facial or a class because they feel uncomfortable, that they don't know who you are. You're just a stranger. So if I have that opportunity to speak with them, I ask them questions, I'll ask if they're married, what they do for work, and I get a little bit of background on them. We feel like we're already girlfriends prior to the appointment. When your customers arrive for the skincare class, you want to first have her finished filling out her customer profile. Because over the phone, you've gotten information about her skin and special needs, but not all of the personal information. So you need to go ahead and get that, and that's a good time to match her foundation shade. It's so important how you greet them. It starts the whole class off on the right foot. So what I like to do is go up and say, hi, my name's Dawn, and you must be and um, shake their hand, say their name, look them in the right eye, and give them a big smile. Just maybe tell look them Look them only in the right eye, never the left eye. How much they're gonna enjoy the pampering that they're going to receive. Once more, just setting the mood that this is going to be fun. <laughs> keep it simple, keep it fun, help them to feel special, and they'll wanna come back and do it again. It's important when you're at that skincare class to stay on focus because otherwise it'll take a lot longer than you want it to and how long they want it to. So what I like to do is if they have a question that they throw out to you, just say, you know, that's a great question. At our individual consultation, I'm going to make sure I answer that and cover that. That's more a great thoroughly. question. And the introduction part Moving of the skincare class, you want to make that really tight, really quick and really exciting. You don't want to just bog them down with too much information. This is my best friend. Okay. Hi, how's everybody today? Great. great. How do your hands feel? Oh, they feel oh, awesome. Oh, is the satin hands great? Yeah. Well, I know you can't wait until your face is filled. I really want to see great uh, as your hands feel. opening Before remarks. Before we get started, I want to thank Kim for having us all here today. Yeah. And as a special thank you, I'd like to give her her very own satin hand sample Where you set. share about the, the something hand. more you found in Mary Kay. <laughs> the salvation and thing. purpose. <laughs> You know, I met Kim the other day at the store and I gave her a sample of our TimeWise skincare. And she really liked it. And we got together today and did a private makeover. Doesn't she look beautiful? Yes. Yes. <laughs> she looks wonderful. And when we get together after the class for your one-on-one -on -one consultation, we'll talk about a look just for you and a private makeover for you. Because when you are my hostess, like Kim is today, you get to earn free products. <laughs> we love that word free, don't we? You know, our favorite saying in Mary Kay is, if it's free, it's for me. <laughs> Just imagine earning some of the products of your choice absolutely free. Kim hasn't decided what all she wants to earn. Well, I've decided that I do want the time-wise products, but since I look so beautiful, oh. <laughs> I think I'm going to take the color products as well. Good choice. And you'll probably earn some of that absolutely free. Yeah, this is very and Vaseline. And so I know that all of you will find something that you can't live without today. And we'll talk about that in your personal consultation, and we'll talk about what you want to earn at your skincare class. But before we get started talking about skincare, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this incredible business opportunity. First, it's because our company's mission is to enrich women's lives. And that's why we have such incredible products. It's also why we allow women to try it before they buy. And we also offer 100% satisfaction guarantee. So how many of you are excited about that? Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever bought any cosmetics items and decided later that you didn't like them? It happened to me yesterday. <laughs> really? Yesterday. All the time. <laughs> and what did you do with the products after you didn't want them anymore? I threw it in a drawer. I um, <laughs> gave it away. Either way, you wasted money. Aren't you excited to know that because of Mary Kay's 100% customer satisfaction guarantee that you'll never waste money ever again? That's incredible. Yeah, right? Oh, please. <laughs> this is also a wonderful business opportunity. We have more than 600,000 consultants worldwide, oh, independent goodness. beauty consultants. And I believe it's because of our company's values. We believe in and God first. And it's literally family. mathematically Sorry. impossible for any of most of them to be making values? any oh. sort of profit. <laughs> <laughs> the company also believes in praising people to success. And we work by the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. You know, I started my Mary Kay business because of those values, because I was so attracted to them, because I'd never worked for a company that had values like that. I got started just to earn a little extra money. That's all I wanted. And then I found so much more with Mary Kay. I went to our convention, and I saw women who were praising each other to success and excited for each other, and I really liked what I saw. And I decided that I would do a little more with this opportunity. And so I got excited about the women who had earned the use of cars. And 
Janet earned diamond rings and trips, and I got excited. When you get excited, okay. Oh my God, is that Mary Kay herself? You know, Mary Kay says there's a new beauty consultant in every single skincare class. So let's find out who the beauty consultant is today. It's so important that you hit on the features and benefits of the products, also how quick and easy it is to use, how few steps there are, and also the visible anti-aging benefits. As the class is going on, I like to tell my guests to feel their skin, use the backs of their hands, and just really feel how great their skin is. And so that's what sells the product, is how it feels to them. And so you really want to get them in tune with that and, and really to encourage them to touch their skin and, and just see how different it feels from when they walked in that door. Okay, now let's talk about healthy looking skin. Because you know, healthy looking skin is the beginning of beautiful skin. And we all want beautiful skin, don't we? More and more, every day. <laughs> I know. Well, Mary Kay knows a lot about that subject because for almost 40 years, we've been a leader in helping women have great looking skin. And one reason for the success is because for many we can years, customize a skincare a program to meet individual needs and lifestyles. Skin. And now I'd like to know how you all answered that first question on your profile. How many of you picked A? Okay, you're pro activist. Any explorers? Oh, me. I love to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any minimalists? That would be me. Me too. Okay. okay. I thought you were a pro activist. Oh, can I be both? Sure pro, you can. Uh, you can be both a pro activist <laughs> and a minimalist. <laughs> Do we have any step masters? No step masters? Step okay, how what? about specialists? Oh, that would be me. I tend to be oily. Well, Mary Kay has products to address everyone's needs. And another reason for our success I'm is so that confused. our skincare products are scientifically I, based I'm on the five master. essentials for healthy looking skin. No, I'm a specialist. Skin. I tend to be oily. The first is to cleanse, and you cleanse to remove makeup and I tend to be oily. The Does that make me a specialist? To remove dead surface cells that dull the skin. The third essential is to freshen, to refine the pores as well as tone and tighten the skin. That's what I need. <laughs> tone and tighten. <laughs> right. The fourth essential is to moisturize to help keep your skin supple and hydrated. And you know what happens if you don't moisturize. Oh, you dry up and wrinkle. Mm. <laughs> right. And no one will ever and love you. Day, you also need to protect your skin from the environment. Now, let's take a look at how TimeWise products help you meet these five essentials to get the healthy looking, beautiful skin you want. As I said earlier, Mary Kay is committed to helping women. And we know that as women, you're pressed for time, right? <laughs> Well, that's why Mary Kay developed TimeWise Skin Care. It gives you a streamlined approach that helps you combine the essentials for healthy looking skin with visible anti-aging benefits. It's a quick, convenient program. The products are formulated with an exclusive patent pending complex that works with your skin's natural system to help reduce the visible signs of aging and give you softer, smoother, younger looking skin. You uh, sign me up. <laughs> In fact, you'll be excited to know that clinical research shows that just Man. after two weeks of using the time Can somebody send me the magic bullet infomercial average, but on VHS? A improvement in skin softness, a 17% reduction in the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles, and an 11% increase in skin firmness. In just two weeks? <laughs> in just two weeks continued use, the results get even better. Just take a look at the results on Doodly this chart. do. After eight weeks, Thank you, you'll Will. see on average a 99% right. improvement in skin softness. So what I'm going to do is a play doodly do while fast forwarding through this tape and a so we can get to the end. Does that work for everyone? Skin firmness. That's incredible. I know. It's exciting, isn't it? You know, TimeWise gives you simple solutions that deliver <laughs> Oh, the yeses. Now, everyone ready to try TimeWise? Let's do it. Okay. If you need to, go ahead and put your hair back with your headband and let's get started. fast-forwarding. It fast-forwards kind of slowly. We'll get, um, we'll get closer to the end, though. There 
papers, leaves, and trash, and paper and cash, they left it all in the gutter. So along comes Dusty a singing this song with a chuckle, a snort, and a mutter. Oh, doodly, 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 do, I'm keeping the street so clean. I'm scrubbing and scraping, I'm pavement landscaping, I'm buffing this place to a sheen. Now just to remember, January to December, I'm Dusty the street sweeping gal. My brushes are metal, I'm in fine fettle with Mac, my big city pal. Oh, doodly, 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 do, I'm keeping the street so clean. I'm scrubbing and scraping, I'm pavement landscaping, I'm buffing this place to a sheen. Okay, this tape is very slow, so I'm adding in a bonus song. This is, is the Mike Tyson without the step to the side. Like anything you're trying to learn, remember, practice makes perfect. Believe me, I know. If you just work with this video and use your imagination, it'll be no time before you're teaching your friends how to hip hop. Tyrone. Don't pass me up, no. Inez. Chris. Mary. Chris. Again. Michelle. Michelle can really pop. Uh, all right, let's do. Oh, that's right. It goes on forever. <laughs> Could probably cut out that beginning part. <laughs> All right, we're at, we're gonna get to an hour in to the Mary Kay tape. Let's check back in. Things down. It's really important. You know, Mary Kay says the faintest ink is better than the most retentive memory. So I write little notes about her, and when I call her, I follow up with wherever we left off. And so I really think that helps to build the relationship, and I think it makes her more apt to book that follow-up appointment with me, because we're already starting to build a relationship. A relationship Hello. is based entirely around hi, this pyramid scheme. this is scheme. Phyllis Sammons. We met yesterday at the store. How are you? Oh, yes, hi. Oh, it's been a hectic day. Okay, well, I'll only take a few minutes of your time. Tell me, how did your husband like that card? Oh, it was perfect. He loved it. Great. And did you ever find the perfect gift? Well, sort of. Men are so hard to buy for. I just picked him up some of his favorite cologne. Oh, well, we have some great colognes in Mary Kay. You know, I'll send you some samples for him to try to see what he thinks of them. And speaking of samples, what did you think of the new TimeWise products? You know, I've actually been thinking about that today. My skin feels so soft and clean. A lot of products make my face feel too. It has to be really dispiriting for I the, also the loved woman that gets sucked into these it was. sales well, cults. I'm so glad you liked it. I knew you would. The when their actual great. interactions and you know, the time with their friends slash customers do not go this way. And a moisturizer, and it sells for forty nine, and that includes a foundation. That includes the foundation. Yes, it does. So let's set up a time when I can come over and we can find just the right color for you. And I'll also bring some other products that you might like to try. Okay, that would be great. Okay, let's pick a time. Thursday or Saturday, which one would be better for you? Oh, Saturday would be best. Great. Morning or afternoon? Mm, morning. Wonderful. How about 10 a.m.? That's fine. Great. Saturday at 10 a.m. And just one more thing, Nancy. Would you like to hear how you can earn some products absolutely mm -hmm. free when it's we get together get on Saturday? Free. I love free. Great. We all love free. This is easy. All you have to do is invite a few friends to join you on Saturday morning so that they can try TimeWise products. So is there any reason why you can't have a few friends join you? I don't see why not. Great. I'll look forward to it. Just one more thing while I have you on the phone. I just have a couple of quick questions to ask you about your skin so that I can... 
I really love what we have to offer our customers. Before I let you go, personal service, tell me about your we skin. We offer them the opportunity to try before they buy. We offer a 100% guarantee and that always gets their attention because a lot of us have made cosmetic buying mistakes in the past. And so that makes her real excited about at least giving this a try. And I also let them know that our products are a wonderful value. When I approach a woman and she tells me she already has a consultant, then I will encourage her to give her consultant a call and I'll tell her about new products that are coming out because I know her consultant will be really excited to hear from her. And I really like that about this business. I've had customers who've called me because they've heard about or seen something that another consultant offered and I really appreciate that. And I think it's what makes Mary Kay unique is that we work together even if we don't know each other and help each other build our businesses. I teach my consultants that this, this is a very, very simple business. It really is. And they think I oversimplify it, but it really is easy and it really is a natural part of what we do. So I teach them if they have a business and if their mouth is open, their business is open. And when their mouth is closed, their business is closed. I'm always open for business. What a weird way of putting that. <laughs> I believe that you have to talk about your business in order for people to know what you do. I don't think people know by osmosis or driving by your home that, oh yes, she sells Mary Kay, so let's stop and do a drive-by selling. I think that they need to know what you do by you telling them. Um, when I was in real estate school, I learned the term, you've got to circulate to percolate, which meant you had to talk about it so people knew what you did. And so I do a lot of percolating to get a lot of business generated. The Go Book is so great because it has everything you need right there to do facials. I mean, you've got your date book, you have everything there, your color sampler cards. And so when opportunities present themselves, you have everything you need. Sometimes it's really hard getting back in touch with people. So if you have the opportunity and you have your Go Book, you can do the facial right then. Customers want things right now in today's world. And so I'm able to provide that with them and it's all right there. I'm gonna use that as my purse and have that right by my side at all times. I'll never want or think I have to go back. I'll have it all right there. All right. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Bye. Oh, hey, Lynn. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Do you have a second? Sure. Been. I've been great. I haven't seen you in so long. I know. So what did you think of the idea for the fundraiser? I think it's a great idea. I just think it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time. I agree with you, and I know how pressed for time you are. You are always so busy. I've been trying to book you for a skincare class for how long now? Forever. You're always too busy to be able to <laughs> I keep telling you, Barbara, I really don't want to do it. me, life without a minute to spare. As a matter of fact, I've got to go by the house, pick up court, and take him to soccer in court? about an hour. Perfect. That gives us just enough time. Court. Enough time for what? Well, I know how you've been wanting to try the skincare line. I know. Your skin is so beautiful. I just haven't court. had the time to make it to a class. Yeah, or even court. a facial. You know court what? Is very I don't want you to wait a court. minute longer. It sounds like a Palin name. Skincare. I have a way for you to be able to have your very own private skincare class right now. Inside here is everything we need for you to be able to try time-wise skincare. That's pretty cool. Oh, this product, Lynn, you're going to love it. It contains all the essentials for healthy, beautiful looking skin, and it saves you time. Plus, it Corner has. Corner your friends in public and benefits. pressure them into letting that you. That sounds great. Watch them hey, smear that? stuff on their face. Well, this, this is a color card. It contains all the basic color cosmetics for a perfectly beautiful look. I love that lip color. Do you want to try this too? I would, but do you think we have enough time? All I need is 15 minutes. I have everything that we need right inside here. Okay, follow me to the house. And we'll have plenty of time to get <laughs> cord to that soccer game. Cord? 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 What? Once you try it today, you too are going to fall in love with it. Julianne, you look gorgeous as always. Do you have 15 minutes to get us that gorgeous? Please. Please. Uh, I do. We've got just that time, so let's start our watches and begin. Okay. Today, we're going to... When you only have 15 minutes in an appointment, you need to make sure that you're focusing in on what that customer wants to know. And so I always like to ask her right at the beginning of our time to gather, since we have a limited time, what would you like to know about today? But you can't go through your whole flip chart. And if you're trying to do that, you're frustrating her and frustrating yourself. If you're sensitive to her time, she'll want to invite you back and give you more of her time because during that time you prove that you really were sensitive to what she wanted. And so the whole idea is to get another 
appointment from that, or just to maintain a long-term relationship with her where she knows you're gonna be tending to her needs and taking great care of her. I think you need to stay focused on you're there to share the product and make sure that she understands the benefits of the product and how to use the product properly. And within that 15 minute period of time, you can share with them how to, to have beautiful, healthy looking skin and enjoy all of the benefits the product has to offer in that very short period of time, but stay focused on the skincare, not getting off on talking about other things because you won't have time to- Don't get off on other things, only get off on skincare. that you're going to, it's even more critical that you pre-profile. And sure, you can use time-wise skincare and it's great for all <laughs> skin types. Dread time. If you haven't filled out that customer profile, you don't know special things she might be interested in that you could bring her that day. If she tells you she's concerned about her eye area, you can bring the eye products for her that day. If you don't pre-profile and you don't know that, then you, you can know that you can opportunity to sell her some great make a sale by negging her eyes. And if she's planning to bring some friends, you want to pre-profile them as well. During those quick appointments, it's very, very important that again, you stay very focused and keep an eye on the clock and make sure that you allow yourself enough time to do the individual consultation. Because if not, and you don't get the chance to book her for a second facial or a skincare class preferably, and you're not able to close the sale because you haven't allowed enough time, you've gotten off on a different tangent. You need to stay don't focused. Don't get off on other things, only get off on Mary Kay. You can do it. Mary Kay always says, you can do everything wrong with the right attitude and succeed, but you can do everything right with the wrong attitude and fail. So enthusiasm is incredibly important to building your business. It'll be contagious. It'll be the thing that sets you apart from all the rest. As independent beauty consultants, we teach women how to take care of their skin. We teach them how to look better, how to feel better about themselves, and we provide personal service, and that's what's so important in Mary Kay, is that we give them the personal attention that they need. Keep your skincare classes easy and fun. Create an environment where you look like you're having so much fun that they would naturally want to do what you do. It'll make it so easy to transition into saying, I would love to share with you a few more details about what I do. It may or may not be for you, but I'd love to give you some information. Mary Kay asked herself, in the beginning of my career, I remember being told that she said, put a sign around everyone's neck that says, make me feel important. One of the things that I always added on to that sign was, make me have fun. When people are having fun and they feel important and they're interacting, that is something special that you can't replace and you can't get via fax or cell phone. <laughs> and when a woman feels that you're reaching out, you're really listening. Oh, you can't have fun with a fax machine. I know some people that would, that would argue. me feel important. One of the things that I always added on to that sign was make me have fun. When people are having fun and they feel important and they're interacting, that is something special that you can't replace and you can't get via fax or cell phone. And when a woman feels that you're reaching out, you're really listening to her, that you actually care, that's irreplaceable. And she will stay a customer for life because she feels special. Our business comes from the heart because when you really love the products, you're going to want to share that with others. You're going to have an attitude that builds confidence because with each step, as you share it with somebody and you see they're excited and they're grateful that you've helped them to look better and feel better, you're going to want to share that over and over again. And it takes discipline every day to go out there and make it happen, but you know what? There's no greater paycheck of the heart in seeing other people look great and feel great. Mary Kay, everyone, selling skincare. I mean, we can go back and watch the full thing if you want. Uh, oh, those are some pretty competent fax machines. The, they've come a long way in their fax machine knowledge. Um, let's see. So we can, um, we have a couple of options here. I was looking at the tapes, and we can either be done with the stream, or I can find that Crocodile Hunter tape that we tried to watch at one point and couldn't find. Okay. Um, sure. Africa's Deadliest Snakes. Let's see if I can find this, actually, for once.
Gee, I hate to tell you this, but I don't know if this tape exists. <laughs> did we maybe... Did it get thrown in the mold pile? Did it have mold? Did we crocodile... I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, it's... It's tape 493, so let me uh, I'm going to unscreen. Mine 493, that's going to be... So it should be on the shelf. Okay, Monster Trucks had mold. But it should be after The Talking Bread from Richard Scarry and Seabird and Happily Ever After, but before Canadian Gardener. Yeah, it's definitely not there, though. I think, yeah, maybe it was maybe it was bad and dead. Let me... Here, let me check the box. Uh, off camera. Uh, no, it's not that box. Let's see. Is it down here? Eh. You know what? That may, we may not have that one. Uh, what do we have, though? Let's see. Let's go for something that's short-ish. So, like, we could do the VeggieTales tape. We could do Johnny, Johnny's Animal Hijinks is pretty, pretty animal-ish in a similar vein to Crocodile Hunter. Yeah, it, there, it had some issue. I really got, I gotta, we have so many tapes in the library now that I have to start actually making sure they get cleaned up and noted when they're, they didn't get screened, but they're dead. Uh, okay, let's see, let's see. How about, sure, why not? I, this'll, this might get, this will be a good test to see if this gets uh, blocked by content ID. It's VeggieTales from Big Idea Productions, Dave and the Giant Pickle. This is a tape from 1996. Uh, let's go find it. Okay, and this one is uh, for ages three and up. Is anyone big enough to take on an eight-foot pickle? Yeah, I've never seen VeggieTales either. I've watched a um, I watched a documentary about the the making of it, like the people behind it. But I've never I never actually saw the show. A new standard for children's videos, raves Virtue Magazine. <laughs> The humor, original music, and overall creativity will capture the attention of child and parent alike, says Marriage Partnership Magazine. <laughs> Have you ever felt too small to do a big job? That's how a little shepherd boy named Dave feels when his big brothers head off it's to defend their country. Good, leaving Dave behind with the sheep. Big people do big things, and little people do little things, they tell him. They're in for a surprise, however, when they find out their foe is much bigger than they thought. Is anyone big enough to take on an eight-foot pickle? But wait, who's out there running that chapter? Dave, the hilarious retelling of the biblical story of David and Goliath teaches kids that with God all things are possible. It makes no difference whether you're eight feet tall or two feet tall with God's help. Even little guys can do big things. Uh, special appearance by the world famous superhero Larry Boy. Copyright 1996, Big Idea Productions. Okay. Sure. So, we still got Mary Kay in there. And Umstead. Here we go. Veggie Tales, Dave and the Giant Pickle. I have no idea how, where this fits in the Veggie Tales chronology, but it seems like it's probably early. Larry, it's time for the theme song. Um, yeah, Bob. W what do I do? Hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, well, how about this? The if original. You play the guitar, Bob, I don't have any hands. Was released oh, on VHS in 1993. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, you play this. Oh, I don't want to play that. 
It'll look silly. Oh, come on. It'll be fun. Nope. Not gonna do it. It's for the kids. Oh, okay. But they better not laugh. Okay. Well, it's time now. You better go on out there. If you like to talk to tomatoes, if a squash can make you smile, if you like to waltz with potatoes up and down the produce aisle. Have Apparently. we got a show for you? Apparently this was made in softimage. Oh, which was actually developed by a guy from the National Film Board of Canada Broccoli, in 1986. Celery, gotta be Lima beans, collard greens, peachy keen, vegetables, cauliflower, sweet and sour, half an hour, vegetables. There's never ever 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 been a show like vegetables. From the ultra Catholic family, like the, he had to give up TV for Lent. And his mom was influential in crusading for our high school to do mass every week on Friday. Everyone loved her for that. Um, and he wa he watched VeggieTales, so I think it's it's cross denominational. <laughs> it was definitely better than chat, leagues above Chatter, way better than the the VBS tapes that we've watched. Anyway, to reiterate, don't send me more VeggieTales. <laughs> Um, it's not obscure, and it's probably going to get copyright blocked. Um, anyway, this has been a fun stream. What, ha what have we learned from God? Chicago, Mary Kay, and Dave. The Chicago tape was very quaint and, and fun. I liked all the old people talking. It had a lot of very adorable old people. Adorable old ladies. Uh, and Mary Kay was just a trip for how culty it was. I'm glad we could experience all these things together here on Golden VCR. I will see you again next stream. Uh, that's going to be all she wrote for today. And uh, yeah, hope you have a lovely day. <laughs>